Uh, our first presenter is, uh, is Antipodes, and that's uh, Jacob Mitchell. He's the founder and the chief investment officer. Uh, the business started back in 2015, so we're about to have our fifth anniversary. Um, the team is now managing about $9 billion uh, on behalf of retail and institutional investors, both here and offshore. Now, uh, I'm sure I don't need to tell everybody in the room that it's certainly been a tough time for value investing, uh, certainly last year in particular. Uh, this year hasn't started great either, but um, we think you should stay the course. Uh, and to tell you why you should do that, I'd like to welcome Jacob Mitchell. Value investing from an antipodes perspective uh, is not necessarily about buying low multiple stocks. It's about paying the right multiple regardless of what the growth rate is. As a pragmatic value manager, we think you can invest across the growth spectrum. So <clears throat> it's been a tough year, as Matt uh, pointed out, um, and I'll, I'll sort of discuss some of the reasons why. But potentially, you know, the key reason is simply we've had such extreme crowding into long duration assets. Uh, we would say extreme, so for even a pragmatic value style, it's been tough to keep up with the market. So what do I mean about investing across the spectrum of growth? You have stocks like ING that are basically GDP growers, but are trading on a market at less than half the market multiple. And we don't believe they are value traps. We don't believe ING is being disrupted. Then we have portfolio holdings that are growing at GDP plus type growth rates. Air travel, in the case of GE, travels, grows at a roughly 1.3 times GDP. Those businesses are on higher multiples, but they're still cheap relative to that growth. And then we have businesses that are genuinely high growth and have a long runway of growth ahead of them. In the case of Facebook and Alibaba, approximately 20% per annum for roughly a 20 times multiple. So we think they are basically pragmatic value. Now, we wouldn't want a whole portfolio of GDP growers, just as we wouldn't want a whole portfolio of expensive growth stocks. We want cheap stocks across the spectrum of growth. So what do I mean by investors chasing long duration? <clears throat> duration is a simple concept. Uh, it applies to fixed income and equities. It's simply the time taken to repay your purchase price. Sydney, so what are some examples of long duration assets? There's nothing special about them. Sydney property, uh, negative yielding government bonds, of which 40% of the entire stock of government bonds is negative yielding, is probably the ultimate long duration asset because you're paying for the privilege to lend to a sovereign. Uh, at times, growth equities can become, uh, they can become uh, equity expressions of long duration. So the time taken. Now, what are these assets sensitive to? They're sensitive to very low discount rates, especially when those discount rates go lower. That is exactly what we've seen happen over a long period of time and very intensely in the last 12 months. Now, this chart here is measuring a very old-fashioned uh, concept of value, which is price to book. And it's looking at the trend performance of high price to book to low price to book. I can hear the groans in the audience from the growth investors. Yes, we think price to book is very old fashioned. So let's think about a different, more complex way of thinking about valuation. Um, at Antipodes, we, um, in our, using our internal quant tools, uh, we're using a multi-factor measure of valuation. And on the left-hand side there, we are essentially looking at how a, the top quintile on a sector neutral basis, so we don't want the data to be distorted by one sector that becomes very expensive. On a sector neutral basis, across each sector, what is, what's the, how are the high multiple stocks priced relative to the low multiple stocks? So it's, it's basically valuation dispersion, and we're measuring that at um, enterprise level, EV sales, EV EBITDA, good old-fashioned price to earnings, but it's a multi-factor capture. So we, on a sect sector neutral basis, we're now close to two standard deviations extreme. So investors are paying up for one group of stocks and they're totally ignoring another group, group of stocks. The other question would be is how, uh, how, let's call it pervasive, is it 
between sectors. Um, in the tech bubble, so high multiple dispersion. During the tech bubble, it's surprising, almost all sectors had this characteristic. You had winners and losers. Uh, today, you're starting to get more yellow, more orange, but there is still some sectors where PE dispersion is quite tight. Now, they don't, that doesn't necessarily mean they're cheap. Um, technology is on a higher multiple, but it means there's not as much expectation that there'll be losers in this space. Uh, the relative outcomes are considered to be much tighter. So we think there's a good empirical case to be made that the market is systematically, given the very, you know, the collapse in real yields that took place in 2019, the US 10-year nominal bond lost 100 basis points, ended the year around 1.5%. Inflation in the US is running at roughly two, so the US has got negative real yields. Negative real yields are fairly rare. You know, we've had a few, you know, we've had a, a period of negative real yields in Europe, in Japan, but if you go back over hundreds of years of economic history, these periods are relatively rare, but they will distort long duration uh, assets because those assets have the most sensitivity to real yields. So we can think about the valuation in an equity sense. If investors are paying up, tending to chase, uh, sorry, tending, tending to chase after a certain style, growth equities being a good expression of duration, um, that style at a, at a global level is now about 1.4 standard deviations expensive, using quite a long, period of, of history, uh, roughly 25 years of data. And then we also have at the other end, low PE stocks that are about 1.2 standard deviations cheap. In a performance sense, you can see the big gap that's opened up, the systematic outperformance of high growth over lower multiple in the last 13 months. So. We're not saying don't buy growth equities. We're just saying make sure you're buying them at the right price. And we're not saying ignore value equities. Just make sure they're not value traps. But just like there are value traps, there will be growth traps, there will be quality traps. For those of you who remember the tech rec, um, companies like Cisco and Microsoft didn't stop growing. They went through what we call growth purgatory, which is you keep growing, but your share price goes down. Why is your share price going down? Because the market derates the valuation. So you pay the wrong starting multiple. Um, we think there will be lots of growth traps and quality traps going forward. Now, if we think about what potentially changes the current regime, what can unwind these very unique, this very unique set of circumstances of very low real yields? We ultimately think very simply that QE is driving you know, asset inflation. It's not necessarily leading to great economic stimulus. Um, that asset inflation is leading to greater populism and greater populism will ultimately lead to inflation. Now, it may not be now, it's, it's a question of when. And I admit, sitting here right now, it's, it's hard to see where those inflationary pressures are going to come from. Let's think about the ability of governments to stimulate. Um, coronavirus is another reason for a lower cyclical or economic environment or a slower outlook for growth. Um, and we think governments will increasingly look to fiscal stimulus. Uh, the, the economies or the regions that have the most flexibility there would be those who have gone through periods of austerity, so Europe, uh, and uh, those who have, in the case of China, a much lower level of government debt to GDP. Now, the US debt to GDP is similar to Europe, but we're already on the road of fiscal stimulus. So how do we think these economic regions respond to a slower growth or to any type of recessionary outlook? Europe, being more socialist, will likely seek to spend its way out of difficulty. 
Now, it will probably, that spending will probably come wrapped, it come in a green wrapper. Uh, there's already discussion around a one trillion uh, green deal. Now, what that money will go to fund subsidies for the adoption of EVs, to accelerate grid investment. But there's a much bigger target that the EU has put out, which is decarbonisation out to 2030. Equivalent of a 2.8 trillion spending program or investment program. Um, how that is funded? Well, probably gets funded out of some of that fiscal surplus that Germany has. Um, but it also may get funded via the emissions trading scheme that Europe already has. So there is a $24 a tonne price on carbon. So expect Europe to go green. The US, I think it's less clear. I think the US will probably look to double down on tax cuts. The first round of tax cuts favoured corporates and favoured uh, higher income earners in the US. I think the next round of tax cuts will be very much targeted at the middle class. Um, now, the US has a 4% fiscal deficit. Now, that is typically associated with a time of economic recession, and we are in the US in really uncharted territory. Uh, the Fed is already restarted QE. So for those in the room who think interest rates will never go up, why is the Fed buying short-dated government bonds today? They are buying those bonds to keep interest rates down. So there's pressure already at the short end on interest rates. So prepare yourself for an environment where markets may see QE not about asset prices, but about actually a necessity to finance the fiscal deficit. So we think a lot of the arguments against inflation have very, you know, there are, in terms of ageing populations, I would, argue, you know, I would argue that does lead to a tighter workforce, a workforce that has more bargaining power. In terms of technology disruption, uh, at the moment, a lot of that disruption is actually creating employment. You know, the gig economy is creating jobs, not destroying jobs. So labour market tightness will ultimately lead to some inflation. How do equities respond to that? Well, in periods of mild inflation, lower multiple, shorter duration equities do much better. Value outperforms growth. In periods of deflation, similar to what we've gone through, it's the opposite. That's the middle chart. And then the final chart is the end of the duration bubble when inflation gets out of control. It gets out of control because central banks and governments in the middle period fight deflation to the point where they actually win. They win because they overstimulate. So what happened in Japan is another interesting case study because we had a period of very low rates, but we actually had an ongoing economic cycle and there were regular rotations between value and growth equities. Um, and point to point, if you adopted a buy and hold strategy, it may surprise you that value actually outperformed growth. I, I would want to re-emphasize though, as a pragmatic value manager, you should be able to ultimately capture alpha from those cycles. Um, but ultimately, you know, when you're buying low multiple, I would stress again, be careful that you're not buying a value trap. So long duration equities are priced for perfection. I think it's very important if you cast your minds back to August last year, there was a small improvement in economic data that drove a violent rotation out of quality growth stocks into lower multiple stocks. You know, <clears throat> that may be a little foretaste of what could come in a much, let's call it, uh, more inflationary economic environment. Secondly, we think there's much more fl you know, fiscal flexibility. Uh, around the world, fiscal tools will be deployed we should prepare ourselves for that. Uh, the world is increasingly looking to decarbonise, probably led by Europe, which will create an interesting investment cycle. 
Um, and the lesson from Japan, the cycle didn't die. Antipodes' portfolio is really taking a, almost a barbell type approach to the current environment. When you have these extremes, when you have a whole group of stocks that look really, really cheap and then a whole group of stocks that look very expensive, it's being uh, selective across the choices that you're being offered. At the, the high level here, we have the higher growth, some of the higher growth names. Uh, why do we like Alibaba, Facebook, Uber, social commerce, um, has a lot of runway. These are advertising models that are benefiting from um, essentially pricing power. Given their knowledge, the knowledge that they have on you as a user, their ability to personalize ads, uh, we're only paying 22, 23 times, as I said, for, for decent growth. Microsoft, SAP, they're just in the cloud, bundling Microsoft P of 25 is growing faster than it's ever grown in its history. So we're just talking about a business that is in the sweet spot. Uh, and then you have the enablers of EV and cloud adoption, the hardware names like ST, Qualcomm, Samsung Electronics. Amongst the industrials, look for the ones that are secular growth stories. Look for the ones there where there is going to be tailwinds from decarbonization. Siemens, GE, you know, they have businesses that make utility scale gas turbines, wind turbines, uh, equipment that goes into the modernization of, uh, of the grid that you're going to need as you deploy battery, battery technology. Uh, then you have the pharma space where you've got lower multiple stocks that have traditionally been defensive but are on PEs of 15 and they do have a decent pipeline uh, that can support their growth. And then in, in, amongst the consumer names, concentrate on names where you are getting protection from some of the disruption that's taking place. Retailers are pushing their private label ahead of traditional brands, but Coke and Pepsi are very close to their final consumer. They control their supply chain all the way down to the final consumer. Now, yes, they're on PEs that are higher than Merck and Roche, but they are also very low risk growth in a world where there's lots, as we know, there is a lot of disruption taking place. Retail banks that are not facing the threat of fintech disruption, and then tail risk protection. Um, I'm going to take one of our more contrarian ideas now and go into a little bit more detail on why we like uh, what is one of the world's greenest aluminium producers, Norsk Hydro. So I'll start with the outlook for aluminium. Um, it has the characteristic as being as strong as steel, but significantly lighter. Uh, now, in a world, but it's much more expensive to make. The world is slowly doing three things. We're making things lighter. We're wanting to make them recyclable. And you know, wherever possible, we're trying to make them you know, ultimately greener. So Norsk Hydro and aluminium tick those three boxes. Uh, give you an example, when you make an EV, uh, because the battery is so heavy, you have to make the rest of the car light. So a high end, a Tesla, will essentially have roughly four times as much aluminium content as a normal passenger vehicle. Um, plastic bottles are going out of fashion versus aluminium cans. Um, there's all sorts of growth opportunities. Now, this is not high growth. We just see aluminium demand growing at a roughly 3% per annum. Now, the super cycle is Commodity supercycle, I, I admit, is probably distant in most investors' memories. Uh, but in the case of aluminium, we think it can come again. Uh, we've got a fairly finely balanced supply and demand market. And as you can see from the chart on the right, the valuation of Norsk Hydro is very cheap. Now I'm going to switch to the other side of the barbell. You can understand that Norsk Hydro wouldn't be controversial for a value investor to have some exposure in something this cheap and this neglected. And then you have a company like Uber. Uh, at the other end of the barbell, but we also think very contrarian. Um, Uber is 
a last mile delivery platform. We think there's a lot of misunderstanding around what Uber is. Many uh, refer to it as a failed unicorn. Um, this is not a concept stock. You know, the, the rideshare business today is larger than the taxi industry. Why have we adopted rideshare? We've adopted rideshare because it's essentially a better mousetrap. Um, it manages the demand for rides with supply. So Uber is a platform, and it's also been able to add delivery of food to the delivery of people. And it's been very efficient in the way that it's cross-sold its, its delivery or its eats business alongside food. Um, so you can see from the chart on the left that we expect a hockey stick growth in profits from Uber. Um, we bought the stock very cheaply. To give you some comfort around the valuation, I think it's great to compare Uber against other companies where the market expects a similar hockey stick growth in profitability. And they are companies like uh, Zoom, uh, Slack, high growth SaaS companies that also are not really making a lot of money today. Those stocks are on 20, in excess of 20 times EV to revenue. In the case of Uber, we're talking about a two and a half times EV to revenue. And revenue is essentially what they take after their rider, after their driver is paid. So it's net revenue. When you invest in Antipodes, uh, you're essentially getting a long portfolio, whether you buy the invest in the long short fund or the long only fund, <clears throat> you're getting a portfolio of uh, long investments that are on lower multiples than the market, that are growing at above market rates, that have above market balance sheets in terms of the quality of the, the balance sheet. In the short book of the long short fund, you have stocks that are roughly on double the multiple of our long book, that are growing at lesser rates uh, for much, for lower quality balance sheets. So, our approach to managing risk, uh, we have the opportunities in the long short funds to essentially invest in very cheap downside protection. Uh, we use our approach to clustering to drive research productivity and manage risk. And we build those clusters from stocks that offer us a combination of margin of safety and multiple ways of winning. So thanks for the opportunity to present. And I'll hand back to Pinnacle, and I'll be back for Q&A at the uh, end. OK, let's, uh, let's move to our next presenter. Um, and this is Hyperion. Now, many of you will know Hyperion. It's, it's our foundation manager in the Pinnacle stable. Uh, Tim Samway is the executive chairman. He's been with the investment team, led by Mark Arnold, uh, since they started. They all got together over 20 years ago. Um, the Hyperion Global Growth Companies Fund is totally best of breed, um, true to label, growth style investing. And by the way, is the number one performing global equities fund in the market over three and five years. So to tell you, uh, to talk about his views on, on the market, would you please welcome Executive Chairman Tim Samway. Look, there's no doubt in my mind, everybody, that there is a uh, world of opportunities in growth over the next uh, 10 years. And, and, and look, the goal of my presentation today is to leave you uh, sim similarly convinced. Um, when we were putting this together in 20 minutes, I think I could have covered any of the strong them thematics over the next 10 years that we've been looking at um, and just covered them in 20 minute uh, increments. Uh, but, you know, so there's everything from AI to cloud to cash to card um, to the effects of environmental change and the winners out of those. But I'm just going to focus on two today. And luxury is the new black is essentially uh, the rise in demand for luxury goods. And uh, go digital and go home or go home is the ongoing digitalization of the global economy. Um, what I'm going to start off with first is uh, luxury is the new black. But let's just set the scene first. So this is a sobering view of US demographics. So the red line is the top 0.1% of the population by wealth. 
and the blue line is the bottom 90% by wealth. And so that's a pretty sobering view. That is the wealthy, the very wealthy, the uber wealthy have not been this wealthy since the 20s. Yeah? And you can see a substantial hollowing out of the middle class in Europe, uh, in, sorry, in, uh, in the US. So what you've seen is jobs that have been outsourced, offshored, sent to the gig economy, but the uber wealthy are getting wealthy because they've had most of the wage rises, they've had asset inflation funded by cheap debt, and they're buying luxury products like they've never before. Let's just look at the next part of this, and this is setting the scene of the USA versus Western Europe. So once again, the red line is the top 1% by share of national income. The blue line is the bottom 50% in this case. And so what jumps out at you there is that um, the wealthy have just been wealthy for years in Europe, um, but there's been this rapid rise in wealth in the US over the last 30 or 40 years, and a drop in wealth relatively um, for the bottom 50%. And so this comes as no surprise when we're talking about the luxury market that a lot of the luxury manufacturers are in Europe and now they're growing because there's the rest of the world to sell to. So they're selling to uh, the Middle East, they're selling to the USA and they're also selling to Asia. And let's start with the most iconic of those luxury brands, Ferrari. So this is a club for rich guys. I want to even going to start by asking you who's got a Ferrari in the room. That's just too embarrassing. But if you are a Ferrari owner, you'd probably want to stand up and shout about it. Um, this is a company that, in, that has, it just has so much loyalty and such long waiting lists. And what we love about it as an investment is we look at periods like the GFC where their order book came off 4% compared to about 40 plus percent, 40 percent um, for their major competitors. And so that gives us that element of capital preservation we really like. Um, what's really good about this in terms of the long-term tailwind is that that high net worth income group that buys Ferraris, that sector or that segment is growing faster than Ferrari can build cars. So this is a car manufacturer that manufactures just a few over 10,000 cars a year. There's only 200,000 Ferraris in existence. That's since they started building them. They've got capacity for 15,000 and they're at a sweet spot at the moment because they're not actually covered by emission controls at the size they are. They will in the future, but it allows them to produce incredibly powerful engines. So as I said, incredibly long waiting lists, up to two years, longer for some of their sports models. And this is evidence that this is a business that can extract maximum margin. So the, the big release was the hypercar. They sent out a key in a box to their absolute premium owners, people who had strings of Ferraris already, they were collectors. And they said on the box, this is the key. We can't tell you the price, we can't tell you the delivery date. Are you in? <laughs> they sold out. And in fact, one guy in the US actually sued Ferrari because they didn't send him a key. Yeah. So this is basically the same club for women. Um, it's, the, it's the equivalent, long waiting lists, loyal customers, and rising prices. So this is a business that's growing 15% per annum, just like Ferrari is growing 15% per annum, uh, terrific margins, um, and incredible demand for high-end leather goods. So uh, the top end bags they sell do sell for 30,000 euros. It's incredible that you think that you could spend 30,000 euros, but then not so incredible when you think a man will happily fork out $400,000 for the entry level Ferrari here in Australia. That's the entry level. That's not even one further up. That's just the Portofino. Um, and look at how those goods have gone over the years. So that Kelly bag over 35 years um, has appreciated 9,500%. That's 14% per annum compound growth over the last 35 years. Who wishes that they bought a couple of Kelly bags back in all those years ago? So it's the same sort of thing. It's got these long waiting lists. Um, Moncler, a bit more of a recent, um, uh, uh, recent story. So this was a, um, a near-bankrupt French ski wear producer 
Um, and in 2003, a uh, change of CEO, and what he did was he changed um, scarcity to virtual scarcity and created a brand around that. So their top selling jacket, the Mayer jacket, it's not $3,700. One of their jackets is, by the way, but uh, it's about $1,800. But the, rip, the bottom line is that these are just black puffy jackets, the type that you would wear, the type not I wear, but the type that um, you would wear on a cold night out in New York, and they're selling for $1,800 through to $3,700 US dollars. And what he said was, there's too many of these jackets in the stores, take them out and put them in the back room, we'll only sell them if people ask them for them. And they were deluged with people who wanted that jacket. So that's virtual scarcity. Um, if you think about their competitors, um, it's a $70 Uniqlo from China. And a really seriously uber wealthy person wouldn't be seen dead in a Uniqlo jacket, would they? My family has four of them, let me tell you, when we went to Europe. <laughs> LVMH. So uh, this is Moet and NC Louis Vuitton LVMH. Um, this is a business that's an accumulator of brands. So it's wines, spirits, fashion, perfumes, cosmetics, watches, leather goods, jewelry, um, and more. Um, it's just acquired and in the process of completing the acquisition of Tiffany, and they'll take Tiffany up market. So this is your last chance if you want uh, those little cheap Tiffany playing cards or a Tiffany silver pen, uh, they won't be available because this is once again a business that's focused on promoting luxury. I mean, many people who are buying into LVMH products are in the aspirational luxury, so they're not quite billionaires, but they're really thinking about being seen as rich and that's why they buy these products. This is a business with the share price is up uh, about 400% uh, in the last 10 years, and it's building a presence in Asia uh, because Asia is just minting uh, new billionaires all the time. Um, Kering is another one. You might not have heard of this. This is another accumulator of uh, brands. This is once again focused on millennials. Um, Kering's up 570% in the last 10 years at share price. Um, its major brand is Gucci, amongst all of the brands, and it was previously known as sort of a, an older person's brand. Um, but what they've done is they've rebranded it as street luxury. So they're doing 1,000 to 3,000 euro bags versus the 30,000 euro bag, and they're less focused on scarcity, more personal service, but also much more focused on social media. So for example, one of their brands is Balenciaga, and uh, there's a terrific story about them using social media and Kim Kardashian, she turned up at a fashion show wearing uh, sort of thigh-high uh, Balenciaga boots and, and apparently not much else, and it really drove demand. I mean, I, I think it lost a lot of page views from guys, but actually real purchasing uh, behaviour from people who really love the product. So there's another aspect of resilience to downturns. Are you getting you know, sort of the, the theme here is that, you know, when things go bad, Ferrari owners don't cancel. Because if you cancel your order, they never, they never let you back in again. You know, if you ever want that Ferrari, just take your order and pay for it on the day. And that happens with Hermes bags as well. So in terms of our investability of this, all of these stocks together, all five, only make up 12% of our portfolio because they are reasonably fully valued. Like we're taking a very long-term view with these. Um, and so what you've got to think about is the capital preservation component that these stocks provide, as well as the growth, because they're doing decent growth. So <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about now is go digital or go home. And before I just get into that chart, I might just reflect on um, the 80s and the 90s. So. I mean, not all of you will remember that, some of you are too young, but I saw, I was traveling in the US recently and I saw a wonderful uh, bit of television in, in, a, in an airport. They had a picture, uh, they had a movie, a vi video of Bryant Gumbel, if you remember him. He uh, was one of the hosts of the Today Show and it was in 1994-95 and he was saying, so this is the Today Show's internet address and he said to his, his co-host, how do you get to that, do, what, do you call it? Like, do you call this on the phone? It's only 1995 where people were openly wondering how to get to an internet address. 
Yeah. So in the 80s, if you had a business and you were good and, and your competitors were in another city, you had a regional monopoly. That is, if somebody wanted to actually find a price from somebody in another city, they effectively needed the yellow pages for Adelaide, Perth or Melbourne. Who here kept the, the yellow pages for Perth? Who here has never seen a, a set of yellow pages? Exactly. So what has changed is that the internet created price transparency. It created, um, it created better supply chains and it allowed um, better competition, which actually has reduced prices to consumers. But what it's created is digital monopolies. So global monopolies where um, the norm is that the first mover advantage basically takes all or, or takes most. And so digitally driven markets have become winner takes most or winner takes all. So I'm just going to talk to this slide here. So this is McKinsey research that we've, we've spent a lot of time thinking about because uh, um, it's basically saying all of you out there, you spend 30% of your time looking at emails and responding to them. You spend about 20% of your time finding stuff, whether it's digitally or anywhere. You spend about 14% of your time collaborating with other people in face-to-face -face meetings and 40% of actual work that makes money for the, for the business. And I just don't understand. If that adds up to 100%, where are the bathroom and cigarette breaks, the informal chats, the Facebook, the Insta, the Tinder, Tinder the whatever you're using, you know, Donald Trump following him on Twitter or, uh, or you know, buying, stock, buying stuff on Amazon this evening. So, so here's the challenge. The challenge for businesses is to make everybody much more efficient and they're doing that through this digital transformation. Timely information to customers, timely information to employees so they can get that information to customers and actually workflow, you know, working with people's workflow to make them more efficient. So let's have a look at some of the uh, traditional players. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because actually um, here we have uh, SAP Oh, I clicked that and that didn't, there you go, SAP and Oracle. So we've taken the other side of the traditional players and you can see the names there. We've taken uh, WiseTech, Medi Medidata, Aconnect, Salesforce, Workday, Microsoft, Amazon, Google. Um, if you think about this, uh, SAP is a business that's gone, it's risen 70% at share price. That's in the last 20 years. So that's less than 3% compound, that's about 2.5% compound growth over that period. Oracle's up less, less than 5% per annum over that same period. So you can understand why we've taken the other side is that there is a bunch of in, incumbents that are they're trying very hard to improve what they're doing for customers, um, but there's another bunch who are sitting there disrupting it and by and large we've taken the disruptors. So let's start with that one of our biggest bets at nearly 10% of our portfolio, Microsoft. Now, um, you know, who actually doesn't use Microsoft? Like the Ferrari question, nobody's really going to put their hand up, are they? No. Okay. So, so like, Microsoft has built up business relationships over many, many years. Maybe not a personal relationship, but you've got a personal relationship with Word and Excel and PowerPoint. You might not like that relationship, but it is your relationship and you just use it all the time. You use it like air. And the reality is you're paying for that. So you're a bit different in terms of a customer from Google's customer, because you're not paying for that, or Facebook's customer. So Microsoft takes your privacy and your security much more seriously, and they've built on that. So what they've done is they've brought the cloud in behind it, and they're transitioning all of you slowly to the cloud. Now, 20% of uh, global corporates are digitized. That's an awful lot that aren't, and, and there's a long runway there of work to get there. Um, they're offering you things like end-to-end -end integrated identity security and compliance and uh, working with teams. Um, you know, Pinnacle's using it uh, has over the last three or four years and it seems like every couple of months a new bit of software comes out that actually improves our lives and makes everything work a little bit, a bit more efficiently. Very impressive. So this is a business that's growing um, quarter to quarter mid-teens and we think that given that it can continue to grow like that for years, the total addressable market is huge, uh, that it's actually on a pretty reasonable Ford PE. It's on about 26 times. That's pretty good for a business that we think can, can keep growing for the next 10 years. And what they've been able to do that other more 
um, stable long-term businesses have struggled to do is actually take you all slowly on the journey from on-premises to cloud. Here's another business that is uh, leveraging the value of employees in sales, service and marketing. So we own Salesforce. Um, you probably know it from the, the sales CRM, but uh, let me tell you, um, it's now building in service and in marketing. And uh, this is a business that has generated about uh, $17 billion in sales in the last year, but it's a $100 billion total addressable market. So we think it's growing rapidly via, via its competitors for a start. We can see the competitors. We look at businesses like ServiceNow um, and a 20% per annum, that's a pretty decent growth in sales. Obviously, they're getting higher growth in profit because there's operating leverage there. Interestingly, the service cloud is going to be their, their biggest segment over time rather than sales, which is all about putting that power in the hands of employees to better service their customers, which keeps customers coming back. So this is another case of a business that is essentially winner takes most. You know, market share at about 39% in service, that's really substantial. Um, and we think it can go further than that. So <clears throat> let me just go back very briefly to a, uh, to a story. Um, in about 1995, I went to a conference on the Gold Coast and they had Michael Bloomberg, who's, who's in the news at the moment, uh, by live uh, video coming in for the, uh, for the keynote address. And at the end of that address, uh, he was asked a question, what are the three big trends that you, will, you think will affect the world for the next 20 years? Now, that's a terrific question. And I found the paper that I'd written it down in one of my little notebooks. He said the three major trends, I'm telling you this is 1995 when Bryant Gumbel was sitting there going, how do you call this internet address on the phone? He said the digitization of data, the global positioning system, I thought that was a pretty weird one at the time because I didn't really understand what that was, and the miniaturization of batteries. So hence, I've, I'm, we've bought Tesla, we own it, but really, it ticks a lot of boxes. It's an iPhone on wheels. There's a nod to digitization, GPS, batteries, and a touch of even the earlier luxury attributes in their cars. Um, this is a superior customer value proposition. Who's actually driven a Tesla? One, two, three, four. You are missing out on something serious. Like, it's just in there. Just book it. Do yourself a favor. Like, it's better than going on a carnival ride. You plant your foot and there's this sort of weird feeling in your head from the acceleration. Um, I mean, why would you pay $450,000 for a Porsche GT3 when a Tesla 3 worth 120 grand can out-accelerate it? Seriously, like this is a customer value proposition that people just don't get yet. And so, you know, the batteries are the best, the motors are the best, that the digital technology is the best. It's you know, working towards self-driving. Um, there are real opportunities you know, for, for growth in this business that I don't think people are taking seriously, but we've been following it for three years. My CIO and deputy CIO own four Teslas between them. They have, they're passionate about it, but you know, we've waited until last month to buy it because the financials didn't stack up. Like, like you gotta, Obviously, there's the great car, and then there's, there's, there's the, you know, buying the thing to make money for clients. But what's changed is that the cash flow is positive. Um, the cars, they're going to deliver enough cars. The technology is, is really being proved. And what's amazing is the competitors are just standing in their wake. If you want to think about it, it's a bit like when the iPhone came out, and everybody was prepared to pay much more for an iPhone than every other every other competitor, and Apple has basically sucked all the profit out of that market. So this is a small weight in our portfolio, as you'd expect with um, Hyperion, we go in low and, and build up. So I come to my last slide. Um, this chart represents the last five years with our global fund, um, and you know we've had 23 years with our Australian equities fund, and it's been a great five years, like clients have done really well and, and we're thrilled about that, but, but what about the next decade? So, Firstly, the uber wealthy uh, don't look like giving up their, their position anytime soon. Like that's all just a one-way street for some time to come. Luxury businesses continue to manage scarcity well and they all trade um, on seriously high returns on it. They all, sorry, 
uh, show very high returns on equity. These businesses are 30% ROE businesses. They're maintaining that. Um, that's, you know, they're reinvesting at a rate your clients can't possibly do. Um, the growth in the digital economy is, is breathtaking. So the total addressable markets are really large, and I'm not even covering things like cloud computing, which has just got you know, a trillion, a trillion dollar uh, addressable market, total addressable market. So the Hyperion view, just to sum up, is that dependable long-term growth is actually still quite hard to find, and that many low-quality incumbent businesses will actually struggle over the next 10 years because they're going to get disrupted. And in fact, some of those businesses that get disrupted, disrupted will just go broke. But that won't preclude a world of opportunities for growth as long as you know where to look. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Okay, so fairly, fairly obviously, it's just discovered why I can't buy a Ferrari. It must be that order I cancelled all those years ago. Um, I'll just have to settle for a Tesla. All right. Um, okay. Now let's try and pull all that together. Um, I'd like to invite Ramzan Jaju to the stage. Ramzan is our head of distribution, joined us about a year ago. Uh, many of you will know him from his previous life at Morningstar, where he was there for several years, the last two of which were spent in Chicago in the head office. Uh, prior to that, Ramzan was a researcher. So he's going to talk to us about some of the portfolio construction issues around uh, using Hyperion and uh, Antipodes in your clients' portfolios. And then we'll have, uh, we'll have some Q&A with uh, Tim and Jacob. So, Ramson, welcome to the stage. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for the introduction. Um, welcome, everyone. Whilst today I might be part of the distribution team, a lot of my friends think that I am a recovering uh, analyst. So at least for the next 10 minutes, I'll get my fix by pretending that I'm on your investment committee and putting up a strong case of why blending these two very compelling capabilities can deliver very robust and resilient um, portfolios for your clients. Now, everyone in this room, when you're building your global equities sleeve, is looking to deliver a specific objective to your clients. And some of you are benchmarking your global equities to a total return benchmark, so you're promising a capital growth, a total return. Some of you are thinking income, and in that case, it could be a target income level. I used to have that at the trust company when I was head of research. And some might be looking simply at sustainability of yield. Some are worried about capital preservation. Those clients, they get very jittery when markets are going down. Low volatility has been on the rise because clients do want to sleep at night. In some cases, you can shield the volatility for those clients. And absolute returns have been around for quite some time, and there are clients that are benchmarking to cash or inflation plus. Obviously, from behavioral finance, some clients are more worried about a loss, much more than having a pleasure of a gain. And everyone in this room is selecting managers to deliver one outcome or another. Now, both Hyperion and Antipodes can be great solutions for some of these objectives. Now, that old adage, don't put all your eggs in one basket, is always true, and every researcher and every investment committee is looking at diversification. And what I'm going to do is a little bit of how I used to do research from 20 years ago to 10 years ago and to what's kind of a fad in the last three to five years. Uh, a lot of people used to use returns-based analysis. Holdings-based became more prevalent. And more recently, the latest craze is factor-based and economic exposures. And I'll give you some taste for that in a minute. Now, the key features, obviously, the global growth from Hyperion is a great strategy. It's very concentrated, 23 securities. And uh, with 23 securities, you'd be thinking high tracking error and potentially higher risk. But you'll see the drawdown has been very attractive, actually. There are regional tilts. There are sector tilts. The average, average market cap is mega cap. So if the market gets a little bit jittery and there's a flight to quality and flight to large cap, this portfolio will do relatively well. And then on the fundamentals, uh, we'll get to that in a moment, and the currency is unhedged. Now, when you're looking at antipodes, we are looking at a value style, be it pragmatic value. And the long-short strategy plays a very important role to, um, to protect the portfolio in down markets. Um, it's still the highly concentrated, 65 securities, so you expect some level of tracking error, when the MSCI itself is about 1,600 securities. There are obviously regional tilts and sector tilts. They complement each other relatively well. 
either you're betting for North America or you're thinking Asia over the next five, 10 years will do well. And the two strategies together should perform pretty well across different uh, parts of the market um, cycle. Now, from a market cap perspective, we are looking at a small, uh, large cap bias as opposed to mega cap bias. Valuations, you can see the high period is about 24 times multiples. Antipodes is a little bit cheaper than the market. What's interesting is dividend yield. Hyperion is giving you less yield, obviously, with growth companies. Um, whereas with the value style, you're getting about 2.7% yield. Debt to capital, from a leverage perspective, both of them are relatively conservative compared to the benchmark. On the currency side, for many of you in the room that have clients that ask about currency, well, you can outsource that decision making to Jacob's team. So they do have active currency management as another um, pillar in their boat or another um, approach to investing. Now, let's look at the style boxes. Um, Jacob mentioned that they do cut across the blend and the growth category. Given there are 65 securities, the ownership zone is pretty spread. But when you look at the blue dot, that one in particular, that's the asset weighted average of the portfolio, it's still sitting in the value bucket. With Hyperion, it's got a much more tight or concentrated ownership zone. There's only 23 securities, tend to be mega cap, high growth. What's interesting is both of them are investing in two stocks. So with 65 securities with Antipodes, 23 with Hyperion, there's only two stock overlap. Now, you know in Australia, with many Aussie equity managers, there tends to be 20, 30, maybe 40% overlap in stocks. Here, you're absolutely getting um, a lot of diversification at the security level. And during the panel session, we'll talk about those two stocks in particular. Now, returns-based analysis. Who remembers all the BDMs that used to come to you with snail trails? Right? The snail trails still do work. If you look at Hyperion, you're taking higher risk, higher return. With Antipodes, you're getting lower risk, either higher return or lower risk. So the kind of, uh, the maths behind it does work. If you blend the two together and get the orange spread, the complementarity of these two strategies means lower risk, higher return. So again, the snail trail analysis kind of is a, is a good way to complement, to understand the strategies. Another way using returns base is looking simply at drawdown. If that crosshair, oops, I jumped too, up too far. If the crosshair is the market, you can see from a drawdown capture, the long short from Antipodes gives you only 50% drawdown. So if the market's down, you really are protecting your clients. On the flip side, if you're investing with Hyperion, you're actually getting about 120, 130% upside. Surprisingly, you're getting lower down capture ratio as well. So if the market's down about 100%, that's only down by 80. So it's actually the quality aspect is protecting capital still with the growth strategy. And of course, uh, another way to look at this is drawdown. The top two charts here is uh, basically Hyperion Antipodes versus the market. You can see every time there's been a market drop, both strategies have shielded capital relatively well. What's really noticeable is the long short. The protection has been even more um, prevalent. So if your clients are asking why they're going to long short, here's a compelling reason why you should be looking at uh, shorting as a way of protecting capital for clients. Now, moving on to holdings-based analysis, about 15 years ago, a lot of investment committees started looking at the portfolio skyline. How many of you guys remember these kind of charts? Anyone in the room? A couple of researchers? I saw Toby earlier here today and others. Well, what this does is looking at the two portfolios, the actual underlying holdings. We're looking at the holdings of the portfolios. What are the fundamentals? The blue lines are valuation or value biases. The horizon is the market. With Hyperion, all the fundamentals on value tend to be a little bit more expensive. If you're looking at price to value, price to cash flow, PE ratios, they all have a little bit of a bias towards growth. Antipodes is absolutely giving you the value bias. It's pragmatic value, but it's actually doing what it's saying it does. When you're looking at growth factors, revenue growth factor is big on Hyperion, but with pragmatic value, you're getting the net income growth. So looking at companies from, um, whether it's from um, revenue versus profit, there are two different factors at play here. And again, as I mentioned earlier, mega caps, slight, you know, in line with market basically in terms of cap capitalization. 
Now, the, the next generation, basically what's happened in the last five years is that there's been a democratization of factors into the hands of advisors. So ETFs, for instance, or Smart Beta is now delivering advisors specific factors they can invest in, momentum versus value and so forth. Some of those institutional techniques is meaning that you as an advisor can also find out how much is your underlying portfolio exposed to different factors and economic exposures. To give you an example on Hyperion, Hyperion's uh, asset allocation is saying 69% in North America. But now you can look at what the revenue of the portfolio is, what's the economic exposure to US, it's actually only 46%. It's in line with the MSCI. Even with uh, the Hyperion portfolio, you are getting some level of exposure from a revenue perspective to Asia and Eurozone. In terms of the Antipodes portfolios, if you're simply looking at revenue, not where the stocks are domiciled, um, you're saying that US makes up 28%, whereas they're having about 25% exposure to emerging Asia. So again, a very interesting play in terms of what diversification benefits you're getting. Now, factors, and um, you know, you've heard of probably Barra, Axioma, Northfield. These are very institutional level um, factor exposures. Jacob has got a quant team that's looking at their factors as well. Um, I've just used the Morningstar uh, capability because that's the shop I used to work at. And um, you can see basically the green bars. With Hyperion, they are actually underweight exposure to value, whereas with the yellow being antipodes, they have a slight bias to, um, to, value, to the value um, factor. Economic mode and financial health are quality. Now, this is Morningstar's equity research team defining quality, but still, it's telling that Hyperion is giving you strong exposure to economic modes and financial health, and antipodes is kind of giving you a diversification benefit there. Momentum has been a big play the last five years. Size premia. Most of the academic books would tell you over the long term, small cap premia exists. Um, and again, in the last three to five years, that hasn't been the case necessarily. Now, the so what factor. Who cares about factors? Why should you care? The truth is that when you decompose markets to the most basic um, unit of fact that is driving returns, you can do scenario analysis. You can see if there was a shock to oil prices, very similar to the GFC period, how did these factors actually perform during those stress periods? In this case, we can see based on Antipodes holdings today or Hyperion Global Growth um, Portfolio, if you had another shock to oil where the price went from $54 to $133 per barrel, there's a massive divergence in performance. We're talking about 15% difference. Now, again, these are just illustrative purposes uh, based on one model, but this is what researchers are doing these days to understand the risks in portfolios. On the flip side, 2014-15, the price of um, oil dropped from $100 down to $40. If that shock was to play out today, Hyperion would outperform, and it would give you about 5% alpha. So you can see that we can't predict the price of oil, but by blending these two strategies, we can absolutely make sure that the managers we have in our international sleeve is protecting us against these shocks. Now, bringing this all together, I did a blend, and I actually blended the Antipodes um, long and the Hyperion um, strategy together, as well as if you use the long short with the Hyperion. Now, the market over the last five years, if you had invested 100,000, it'd be up to 162,000 pretty strong market returns. Here's the blend using the Antipodes long only, 50-50 with Hyperion. And if you use the long short, again, the long short actually had a great 2015-16 period because the shorts were actually protecting the portfolio. So it ended up very similar outcome, very strong alpha, but different market conditions, obviously different strategies um, worked well. So that's just a little bit on portfolio construction analysis. Hopefully your investment committee would uh, accept that thesis of why these blends are a very good um, way to give your clients exposure to global equities. I'm gonna call uh, Jacob and uh, Tim to stage so we can actually start the panel session. Is there anything that's keeping you up at night in February 2020? I think probably the, the major tail risk that we see for markets is the, ultimately the buildup in lower quality debt. Um, I think we have a slide in the appendix um, and, uh, and what it means, you know, I think uh, what they call leveraged loans or high yield bonds leveraged loans 
Um, they are really, you know, it's sort of reminiscent of what happened prior to the global financial crisis. You know, we're slicing and dicing very low quality debt um, and upgrading it because of diversification. And it is underpinning a lot of what's going on in private equity. Um, and that private equity accounts for about 70% of the leveraged loan market. Um, so you get a, a yield enhancement with lower risk, apparently, when you sell that debt to, to Japanese regional banks who are des desperate to get yield. Um, and I think that's, we see profit share, if you look at what's happening in the, you know, the, the winner takes most phenomenon, you know, with the mega caps taking more and more profit out of the, out of the economy, means the bottom section of corporates are just getting more and more pressure and they are often the corporates that end up in the hands of private equity. So as that pr pressure intensifies, and I think ultimately populism will also see, you know, we've got generational low corporate tax rates in the US. Um, they can't go much lower. Interest rates can't go much lower. And profits uh, margins in those weaker companies are under pressure. I think that's a pretty toxic combination if we get a weaker economy. Um, and that would be, you know, some form of credit crisis, which the Fed would have to then respond to. 2023 would be my, my call, because that's when a lot of that debt starts to mature. Great. Tim, what are your sleeping patterns like at the moment? Anything keeping you up? Interest rates generally are, are sort of the major risk to Hyperion, where we, we've invested in long duration assets. You know, most of those businesses I talked about we're not taking the one-year view, we're taking the 10-year view, and clearly a substantial rise in interest rates would change, at least in the short term, it would change the valuation on those businesses. But, you know, like we're looking at businesses that are on average growing at better than 20% per annum, so that would be a short-term correction. And there is no real sign that interest rates look like they're gonna rise anytime soon. In fact, what we're seeing is you know, potentially slower GDP growth um, slower population growth and actually lower interest rates. So I don't think that's a risk in the short term, but um, you know, in the longer term, because we're constantly thinking out 10 years, that would be something we'd need to be aware of. Um, in a moment, I'm gonna hand over to the audience to ask questions, but something that might be surprising to the audience is we do have a value manager and we have a growth manager and you're both are holding you know, Microsoft and Facebook. Um, you've given the reason, Tim, as to why you're holding it. Jacob, maybe you can explain your views and how can you guys be holding these stocks with such divergent processes and styles? They're both cracking companies. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I mean, we, we see uh, Microsoft as being, you know, as I said in the presentation, it's in this sweet spot where, and as Tim pointed out, you know, essentially you still got a long way to convert everybody to, to uh, the bundle, Office 365 bundle. Uh, and eventually, I think most corporates will end up there. So they're probably only 25, 30% through their own user base. And when they convert uh, you to that bundle, they're converting you to a subscription. And the market will put the su subscription model on a higher multiple. So you've got a re-rating opportunity. I think the Azure, you know, when you think about Microsoft versus Amazon, I don't, by the way, we don't necessarily think Amazon's overvalued. Um, but if I had to choose between AWS, Amazon Cloud versus Microsoft Cloud, I'd go for Microsoft Cloud every day because they're selling infrastructure bundled with software. And, um, and you know, if you think digital infrastructure, you think about the valuation of physical infrastructure, we put it on a very low cap rate. Um, I think ultimately, you know, digital infrastructure will also end up on a very low discount rate. So Microsoft on, 35 times? I don't think it's out of the question. Maybe a bit more controversial stock, Tesla. It was touched on by Hyperion. Any, one of your competitors in the marketplace has been shorting it. So do you have a view on how Antipodes has been looking at Tesla? Well, you know, uh, you know uh, complete disclosure, you know, we, we have, you know, shorting for Antipodes has clearly been, um, whilst it's given us downside protection, you know, it hasn't point to point over our, you know, um, over our, our history, it's been hard to capture out and Tesla's one of the few shorts that we, you know, one, you know, is one short which we ended up with positive. Now we shorted it not because we didn't believe that EVs would be, there'd be mass adoption. We, and we liked, you know, Tesla going after the high end absolutely makes sense. 
Um, we showed it because the, through the, you know, the entry into the mass market, they're just entering a very competitive industry with big companies like Volkswagen and Toyota serious about EVs. And it was, at the time, that was, I think, the right rationale. We covered it. <laughs> Thank goodness. And, and to be fair, to be fair, I mean, the, the 2018 was a horror year for them in manufacture. They went off and did Model X, which was like, what the hell? Um, a huge, um, um, a, a huge four-wheel drive. Um, and Elon kept on, you know, putting out ridiculous tweets that, <laughs> that you know that threatened his his continuation with the business. So. Like you know, there was a period there where we were sitting there loving the product, but actually really worried about the business. So you know, we don't short, we 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 don't take that side of the market. So you know, like sure, it was a good move in in that period. So and you closed that short quite some time ago as well, right? Q3 last year. Yeah, we closed yeah. it at early in 2019. Uh, oh, the only error we made is we didn't go long. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, can I see a show of hands? Who wants to ask a question? Any, any questions around the room? Emma's coming around. Just re Tim, just refresh my memory on your, um, on your performance fee, please. Just expand on that. The 20% the performance fee in relation to your global fund? Oh, yes. All right. Yep. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so the, the base fee is 70 basis points. And the performance fees is 20% of the outperformance of the MISCI. It's got a high watermark and uh, it doesn't get paid if the uh, gross performance is negative. Any other questions around the room? Or well, what? Oh, there's one at the front. Simon? Tim, uh, is that on? I asked you a question a year ago of Asia. Um, you're very US, European dominated. How are you getting in your comfort with Asia when it comes to growth stocks? Yeah, so um, slowly, um, you know, we've spent uh, years looking at the Chinese internet names. Uh, we've, gee, we've got close to Alibaba. Um, but, you know, we, we're very cautious and very conservative and we are uh, very concerned and wary of their... Um, the variable interest structure, the VIEs, because you know, like you don't own the business, you don't own the assets, you actually just have a right. And um, you know, it's all very well to say, oh, the Chinese would never fiddle with that, but you know, like Tiananmen Square, they don't give us stuff. Every now and then, they just don't give us stuff. Having said that, uh, our, our confidence in uh, Asia is getting more, uh, more, you know, is firming up. But there are still high levels of corruption. Um, you know, it, China is a one-party state um, and there are some real risks in terms of um, ownership of um, intellectual property and like I could go through the whole list. So we're getting closer, but um, it, it still gives us some um, um, moments of concern. So, and the other thing is, is that the valuations are still quite good in the US and Europe, um, more in the US, and that's why our, you, know, you can see the weightings. And, and we'd rather take a risk-adjusted view of it and then say if you, if you can get a better return for a lower level of risk that we feel in the US in a, in a wonderful you know, first world market without all of those issues, we'll take it. I'll ask a question whilst we get some more brave people to ask questions. So one of the biggest risks in 2019 was a uh, potential world recession. It started 2020 and people are still talking about perhaps Europe might again um, be the reason why we might have a recession. The IMF only last month said that last year's growth rate was only 2.9%. Now, post GFC period, the growth rate was, um, the world growth rate was at 3.8%. Is the risk of Europe going to recession? I mean, other Europeans, you know, have a tendency to have fiscal austerity instead of spending. Is that a real risk this year? How does that play out in 2020? Jacob, maybe you'd want to start that one. Uh, so Germany is already in an industrial recession, um, and uh, and getting what you know still, you you would argue it hasn't reached the bottom of that, uh, and coronavirus will will mean that uh, you know the recovery will be pushed out, but it will tend to be a bit more of a V-shaped recovery. Uh, Germany, I think, is you know losing some of its competitive advantages uh, in in autos. You've had. Some different shocks, you know, to Europe: Brexit, uh, Dieselgate, um, as China slowdown. I, th I think you're getting as you muddle through. You know, Europe will will probably avoid a, a broad, you know, like a technical recession. 
Um, but policymakers probably need to, to respond to the slowdown and there's a lack of coordination in Europe. So there is a risk that um, they muddle into a recession. I mean, growth has been slowing for the last 40 years. Like, don't, don't imagine that it's just a last 10 year thing. If you actually look over the last 40 years, growth has been gently coming down. I mean, there are some points where it picks up, but if you look at the long-term trend, it is still down. And that's why for both Antipodes and for Hyperion, it's just so important to get the companies right. Because, I mean, the worst market, the worst uh, investment, you know, our view is that you can take over the next 10 years as an index investment. Because the majority of businesses are really going to struggle in that low GDP environment. And the reason we say that is because of those comments I made about competition. There's new world competition, and this bunch of businesses, and there's this rump of businesses that still haven't quite worked out how the new world works in terms of competition. And they're really going to struggle over the next 10 years, next 20 years. I would add, though, and you know, when you look at the valuation of, uh, let's call it, domestically exposed European equities, I mean, they are really pricing a recession. Mm. So, you know, anything less bad than a recession should get is good some performance. <laughs> <laughs> yep, good for cyclicals. Um, any questions from the room? I do have one last one for uh, Jacob in particular. As long as I remember, Australian advisors have been using a global long short strategy as part of their global equities um, allocation. And with the shorting that's being done in the strategy, has the case for shorting become less relevant today or it's become more important given where the markets are? Uh, so markets, since we started are up 60%, uh, we've had an average net of around or just over 60. Uh, we've, to the end of December, we're in line with, roughly in line with the market. You know, shorting is clearly, it's cost us about 3% per annum. So our investors would be better off if we hadn't shorted anything. Uh, the flip side is in drawdowns, uh, we have had protection. So we have two funds. We have the long only fund. Um, you know, we're offering two strategies here, uh, servicing two different parts of the market. Um, you know, we, we really see the long short as having an insur insurance policy uh, that we think you know, when we say through the cycle, three to five years, we say typically, we haven't really had a bear market. Um, right. So uh, I would say stick, 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 with, the the, stick yeah. with the insurance policy and um, in a tougher environment, the, the shorts uh, you know, will recover some of that, let's call it down payment on protection. Well, unless researchers and um, consultants are starting to move away from long shorts, um, your strategy still offers a very compelling reason for clients that are worried about drawdown. There's no doubt, and I hope that the slides help with that analysis. Look, if there's no other questions in the room, we do want to get you out of here before two o'clock. Um, one last chance for a question. Otherwise, I'm going to draw the session. There is one at the end. OK, two, and that's it. We'll call it to a draw. Start from the back. Uh, hi, uh, this question's more for um, Jacob, if that's all right. So obviously, 2019 has been a pretty tough year for value in general. Um, I was just wondering if there's any changes to your portfolio and your approach um, looking forward to 2020 and maybe in 2021? Yeah, look, when we um, sort of did the post-mortem on the year, uh, which was a you know, fairly tough uh, process, there certainly, you know, when we went into 19, 19 um, it, it, you know, with, if we had perfect foreknowledge on collapse in real yields, we wouldn't have been short some of the higher growth names and uh, maybe we were slow to adjust that, that exposure in the short book uh, because it's, it's just been tough when you've got slight, you know, when you're biased towards even as a pragmatic value approach, uh, it, it, there's going to be a period where style extremes get so um, stretched, it's just going to be hard for your long book to keep up. And if you're reinforcing that with a little bit too much growth shorts, and we've tried it really hard to keep balance in the shorts between cyclicals and, and growth, but the growth shorts have cost us. So we have pulled them back and we've somewhat been a little more oriented towards uh, optionality, like when markets are really excited, just buying cheap puts for the portfolio to give us that downside protection rather than just having simple names. But we still have a lot of, you know, Putting, making that clear, 75% of the book is still in single names. 
There was one more question on this side. Thank you. One of, the, one of the risk metrics that I like is the um, Sharp Ratio. Could you comment, please, on what the Sharp Ratio is for your fund, the Global Fund, Tim, and obviously for activities as well, Jacob? Sure. Um, risk adjusted return relative to yeah, cash. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I know what no, the no, Sharp no, Ratio is. I, interesting, like, we, we don't spend our lives um, calculating the I mean, I know it's positive and I know it's well and truly positive, uh, but, but I don't have it in the top of my head from day to day. Um, it requires a little too much focus on the market as your point of comparison, as opposed to the absolute holdings. And we tend to not think as much as the rest of the market about measures that include tracking error and you know comparisons to um, uh, you know uh, other risk-based returns. We think much more about long-term absolute returns. That's why we value everything as an IRR. We're thinking about the total return we'll get over the next five years for uh, for every client for every stock. So my apologies for not having it off the top of my head. Not at all. Jacob, do you want to take that or can I? Uh, yeah, look, we're, we've got a sharp ratio of just above one across the three strategies, long, short, long, global, long, long, Asia, long, short. Um, yeah, we think capture ratio is uh, probably a, a better expression of how we think about the risk. Great. From a researcher perspective, years ago, I asked the fund manager about these kind of ratios and said, mate, we're absolutely benchmark unaware and similar to Tim's question yeah. that's, or answer, that's, that's what I got. The Pinnacle distribution team will share their statistics with you. Obviously, sharp ratio versus cash, your uh, strategy would have been doing very well. Information ratio, which is benchmark aware, Hyperion would be off the charts. Yeah. And we're happy to share that with you through our distribution team. Matt, I'm going to call you up here to close off. Thank you, guys. Thanks for those Thank you. very valuable Thank you. insights. Well, look, that brings us to the end of today's uh, presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming along. Thank you for your support of Antipodes and Hyperion. There are CPD points available for today's session. Uh, we partner with Portfolio Construction Forum uh, to administer CPD. So at the end of this series, so that's the week after next, you will receive communication from Portfolio Construction Forum on how you uh, obtain your CPD. Um, so look out for that. Also, uh, if you would like to see a copy of, t a copy of today's slides, uh, the, uh, there is a, a landing page. It's pinnaclemasterclass.com. So pinnaclemasterclass.com. If you don't remember that, there's uh, all the details of the Pinnacle Investment Team is in these booklets which are on your desk. Please take them with you. Um, and we'll be able to uh, help you out with that or any other questions you may have that didn't go answered today. Once again, thank you for coming along and for your support and have a good afternoon.